We've been talking about and, and looking at all of our stuff. And I'm not talking about our emotional or necessarily our baggage, as some people would think of the stuff we carry, but I'm talking about the material stuff we have. And last week I shared some statistics with you, and one of the things that I said, and it was not a typo, even though there was a typo on the screen, it was not a typo, but each of us in our homes have 300,000 items, believe it or not. I don't know how many of you went home and counted, Maybe some are still home counting that, but the average home is about 300,000 items. We have a lot of stuff. And one of the things that I had mentioned is when is enough enough? When is enough enough? That's the question that we answer. We live in a very materialistic world, a society that tells us we need everything. When is enough enough? And then last week specifically, we looked at contentment robbers or what robs us of our satisfaction. And what I shared with you is comparison. For those who are writing out keywords, one of the things that robs us of contentment or being satisfied is comparison. And we looked at the parable of the workers in the vineyard. And the workers who started at the beginning of the day, let's just take numbers, keep it simple. We're going to work for a dollar a day. The second group came in. They were going to get paid. The third group, fourth group, fifth group came in. At the end of the day, the last were paid first, and the last people were paid a dollar. The first people who thought they were going to get a dollar probably figured, oh, this owner is really generous, and he's going to give us maybe four or five dollars. We're going to get so much more. Well, at the end of the day, they all got the same. And I said, what happened with contentment in there? At the beginning of the day, they were happy because they got hired and they were going to earn a dollar. But at the end of the day, they were unhappy with it. Anger, resentment, jealousy, all of those things set in. But the owner gave them what they were agreeing to at the beginning of the day. But what happened is at the end of the day, when they started comparing what they got to what others, it robbed them of their satisfaction, didn't it? And I said, we do the same thing. Our car is good enough until we ride in somebody else's new car or truck or their camper or we go visit somebody's home. We thought our furniture was good enough until we sat in a new couch. Huh? Did that Friday afternoon. I thought my couch was pretty good downstairs until I sat in a new couch. We compare, don't we? And all of a sudden, what we were satisfied with, we're no longer satisfied with, is it? How much stuff is enough stuff? Well, this morning, I want to keep us moving on that same line of thinking with satisfaction. But this morning, I want us to think about where do we really get our identity from? You know, we talk about identity theft. You can't watch TV without seeing something about identity theft or like life lock, which will prevent you or protect you if you have identity theft, but where do we get our identity from? Where do we get our identity from? Where is our self-worth really from, if you will? And when you think of self-worth, it's really all about not net worth. This isn't about money. Net worth and self-worth are two different things. I've talked about that the last couple of weeks, and you'll hear about that for the next couple of weeks as well. It's one thing to have self-worth, but it's another thing to have net worth. What are you, your self-worth? I may get paid for my occupation that gives me net worth, or gives me so, uh, yeah, net worth, but what is my self-worth? See, I don't get my identity from being a pastor. I bring my identity to my pastorate. I don't get my identity from my car or my house. I bring my identity to that. Believe it or not, you don't get your identity from your job. You bring your identity to your job, don't we? Now, those of you who are doing the life group are going to be learning a lot more about this either today or this coming week, depending upon when your life groups meet. But where does our identity really come from? How do we get our identity? How do we figure out who we really are and what our self-worth really is about? And you see, it's not about money. It's about spirituality. And if you really want to get down to brass tacks, it's all about generosity. Because it's not what I have, it's what I give away. If faith without works is dead, 
then it's not what about what I have necessarily inside of me, but what I do with what's inside of me and how I give it away. When we look at our faith, our faith does not determine our net worth. Our net worth and our faith are interrelated because it's what we give away out of our faith that really makes us valuable. I've shared for the last couple of weeks, when we go to the grave, (laughs) we brought nothing into this world, the Bible says, and we take nothing with us. But what we do with what we've been given makes all the difference. That's our net, our our, our self-worth, if you will. What we do with what we have to make a difference in this world is what we're going to be held accountable for one day. I was reading that again in my devotions this morning. When we get to heaven, we we have our eternity for those who belong to Jesus Christ and have professed Him as their Lord and Savior, right? We have our eternity, but the rewards we get in eternity are going to be based on what we do on this earth, Works. We're not saved by our works, but our works are the way that we show God we love Him. And when we work out our faith, that's what we're going to be rewarded for. It's that work that really identifies our net worth. Our net worth enables us to do that work. If you look at Jesus' words in Matthew 6, verse 21, there's a difference between self worth, net worth, spirituality, generosity. Matthew 6, 21 says, For where your treasure is, There your heart will be also. Again, I want to be very clear. It's not about money. It's all about spirituality. Now this morning, in keeping with that theme, net worth, self-worth, contentment, I want us to think for a few minutes about where we get our identity from. It's 2016 in Byron Center, Michigan. We just got done baptizing three Babies. Three couples presented their children for baptism. Beautiful little babies. Every one of them alive and well. Loved tremendously by their parents. I could see that when I was in their homes. Just loving on these little kids. And these babies are blood members of their families. They're born into that family. In fact, each one of them was given a special name. Huh? Nora, Jace, and Riley. Carefully picked out. Can't imagine another name for any one of them. They are now Nora, Jace, and Riley. They will have that name because their parents identify with that name and they're going to love them with that name and they're going to nurture them with that name. Each of them was given a last name. It's the name of the family they were born into. Same name as their parents. They're also born into a church family, baptized into God's family. But this morning, I want us to back up. Today's 2016, but I want us to back up, if you will. Let's go back a couple thousand years. Let's go back to maybe 60 AD, the time of Paul, when Paul writes his letter to the church in Ephesus. And for those who have been here for most of my messages this year, I've talked a lot about Ephesus. A lot about Ephesus. In the seven letters to the seven churches, we talked about Ephesus. And we've talked about Ephesus a number of times. Ephesus was a rich, rich, rich city. They had everything. It was a seaport town. They had commerce. They had a huge market. Goods from all over the world. Whatever people really wanted to get in Ephesus, they could have it. They had money in Ephesus. It was a major trade route. Their location, even across land, it was kind of the gateway into Asia Minor. They had marble streets, mosaic marble streets, and they're still there today. I had the privilege of walking those five years ago or so. They had homes built into the hillsides, Stones were in the front of those buildings. They had 25,000, they had a theater that would hold 25,000 people. That was huge in its day. 25,000 people theater made out of stone. It's still there today. They had all kinds of religions to choose from. There were over 15 gods or goddesses in temples. Ephesus was rich. They could pick and choose and have whatever they wanted including their children. Let me explain that. In those days, in Roman culture, when a newborn baby was born to its parents, the newborn was frequently placed at the feet of its father. If the father desired to keep the child, the father would pick up the child. 
if for any reason the father didn't want that child, it may have had a blemish, it may have had a defect of some kind or other, it may have been uh, a birthmark, or it may have been a girl. The father would simply not pick up the child, the father would turn its back and walk away. I know this is kind of harsh, but those babies were then left outdoors, exposed to the elements, and quite often they ended up at the local dump. Or they would end up in the marketplace. Where if the baby was lucky enough, the baby would be adopted, or would be bought rather, by a family who saw potential in it, especially if it was a boy, and they could sell it later to become a slave. That was commonplace. Again, if you're doing the life group study, you're going to read about this in the material this afternoon or tonight, whenever you're doing that. At night, as we're told, people could walk past the marketplace or walk past the dump and hear the faint cries of these babies. That's the background for Paul's letter and the first chapter to the people in Ephesus. You need to know that in order to understand or get a better understanding of what Paul's introductory chapter, chapter 1, is all about when he writes to the people in Ephesus. They had all the belongings of the world, if you will, might I say identifying with the world, and yet many of the people there did not know who they belonged to. All the belongings of the world, but they didn't know who they belonged to or where their identity came from. Look at the chapter with me. First 13 verses. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Paul's the writer of the letter. To God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise for spiritual blessings in Christ. Heading here. Verse 3. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to praise to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we, who were the first, put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until redemption of those who are God's possession, to the praise of his glory." We could talk about this text all day long. For the next couple of weeks, it's rich. But I want to respect our time this morning, and I want to give you several things in here that I hope that you will write down. Write down some of the key words. They'll be on the screen, or if you're using version, you can mark it up on your notes in version. But what I want us to understand this morning is where do we get our identity from? Where do we get our identity from? When you look at this text, first of all, let me be clear. It isn't about stuff. It's not about stuff or the things of this world. We get our identity from the creator of the world. Not from the stuff in this world, but from the creator of the world, the one who we belong to. Look at verses 3 through 6. It says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for... Adoption to the sonship through Christ Jesus in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. Let me write 
write a few write a few of these things down as I share them with you this morning. Verse 3 says, Jesus Christ has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. I want you to think about that when Jesus, when God created the heavens and the earth, he created everything. And what did he say for the last day? Mankind, didn't he? On the last day of creation, he created mankind. When he began creation in the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth before he created light and animals and separated the sky from the water and the fish and the fowl. All of that was in mind, in place, before he put man on this earth. The last thing he created was man, and that was the pinnacle of creation, and he gave it all to them. I don't know about you, but I think that's awesome. God put everything in place, carefully thought out, created all things. Man is the pinnacle. And then verse 4 says, then he chose us. And he didn't just choose us to be part of his creation. He chose us to be holy, set apart, sanctified, if you will. When we look at these kids this morning who are baptized, God placed a sign and a seal on these kids. They're set apart as his. There's a part of sanctification in there, isn't there? And he chose them to be part of that at the beginning of time. He chose us to be holy and blameless. Not just simply to belong and be part of creation, but to be a special part of creation. A holy and blameless part. And if you look at that text carefully, and I know I'm moving fast on this this morning, but it says, He predestined us. It was all planned out. And He adopted us, it says. Maybe some of you are adopted. Maybe some of you have adopted children and you know what this is about. Maybe for you, you understand this better than other folks. But he says, he's adopted us to be his sons and his daughters through Jesus Christ. God the Father adopted you and I. When I think of these babies in Ephesus, when they're adopted, they have a new identity, don't they? You know, when I really think about it, we don't belong to this world, do we? We are children of the king, a heavenly king. He adopted us. And you see, when you're adopted, several things happen. First of all, your family changes. I I love looking at these babies and I'm saying, you know what? They've got more than just their parents and their grandparents and their aunts and uncles. They're adopted into the church this morning. The whole church family's here for them. In some ways, their family's changed. They got a bigger family. You're the family who made the commitment. You said, we do God helping us. To promise to pray for them and to encourage them and to love them and accept them and to help them grow in their faith and serve God and their neighbor. They're part of community when we're adopted. Our family changes. Our family name changes. When we're adopted by Christ, we become Christian, don't we? And our home changes. Paul tells us our citizenship is not here. Our citizenship is in heaven. And when we're adopted, our responsibilities change. When God adopts us, we have privileges and responsibilities. Look at verses 7 and 8. It says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. Circle that word, lavish. I don't know how to explain that, but, but maybe just to say, God gushed on us. He just loved us that much that He just poured it all out. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, right? He just he gave it all, His one and only. He just lavished His love on us. You ever been lavished with love by somebody? Maybe that needs to be your challenge. Go lavish your love on somebody. Just gush out on them. They're going to wonder what happened to you. But don't you just know love when you feel it? When somebody just pours it all out, you know it. That's God. God gave it all and just just put it all out there for us. He lavished that love on us. Now let me tell you what lavished looked like when it comes to God's love. First, we've been purchased. We've been redeemed by the blood. This morning we're going to celebrate communion, the body and blood of Christ. The Old Testament didn't work, did it? There wasn't enough blood. There wasn't enough dead dead animals and guts and gore that would ever pay the price for sin. And God says, I'm going to fix it once and for all. We're going to put my son on a cross. 
And His blood is going to make us clean. That's redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Huh? We've been purchased with a price. And we've been forgiven. That blood, Christ's body, is where we have our forgiveness. The Bible is so clear. There is nothing that you and I could ever do. There's no amount of money we could pay. No amount of animal sacrifices that could ever pay for our sins, is there? There's not enough money in the world that could ever cover yours and my sins. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. How did God do it? This thing called grace. You want to know what's so amazing about grace? It's God's riches at Christ's expense. We couldn't do it. God did it. Look at verses 13 and 14. It says, when you believed, when you believed, parents this morning presenting their kids, when you believed, you were marked in Him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, just a deposit. It's just a bank account that you started. You just made a deposit in it. Guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of His glory. We've been marked with a seal. You know, when you think about a seal, a good housekeeping seal of approval, if you see the good housekeeping seal of approval, you can trust it, can't you? When you see the underwriter laboratory, UL seal of approval, when J.D. Power says, I give this five stars, this is the seal of approval, you kind of trust it, don't you? When you go to the bank or you get a mortgage, they emboss it with a seal, don't they? They put an official seal saying, this is approved, this is guaranteed, this is authentic. This is commitment, it's going to last. This isn't so phony, this is for real. God puts a sign and a seal on us and He gives us the Holy Spirit as a deposit. Just as a deposit until one day we get the whole inheritance, isn't it? And when I think about these baptisms this morning, doesn't Jesus say, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? That's the sign and the seal, the deposit, guaranteeing what's theirs one day when they claim it for themselves. You see, for Jace and Nora and Riley, Sure, they're Dykstra's, Timmermans and Concitus's, but their real identity, these are children of the King. They are children of the King. God who is in heaven on the throne is watching over them. And they've got an inheritance now that will never perish, spoil, or fade, waiting for them in heaven because they were sealed with the Holy Spirit, a deposit guaranteeing them of what's to come. I always say, don't get too comfortable with this earth. Because what we got coming for those who are in Christ will be far better than anything we could ever imagine here. I'm not saying you don't enjoy it, but don't get too comfortable. When I spent some, I had to spend some time in my office this morning, which I usually do on Sunday morning, but I was looking at Revelation. I was looking at the last chapters of Revelation again this morning, just looking at heaven. And I'm thinking, we got to come back and look at that this fall. We spend a lot of time looking at this world. Right now we're looking at all this stuff with this world, but it ain't, and I know that's not good English grammar, it ain't about this world, is it? We don't live for this world. I love what Francis Chan does, in a, does an illustration, and he takes about a 12-foot rope. We used it here one time. About a 12-foot rope. And he takes one inch of that rope at the end and he puts a piece of red tape around it so you have 11 feet, 11 inches on the rest of the rope. And he says, this is your life. 12 feet of rope. And he says, a little one inch red at the end, that's your life on earth. That's where we get the Holy Spirit as a deposit so we can live out the 1111 in eternity. I want to wrap this up and move on to communion, but 
You know, I think we're a lot like Ephesus. Let's be honest, we have everything we could want. You may not feel rich, but I'm going to tell you, by the world standards, every one of us are rich. If you've got a bed, a roof over your head, some form of transportation, even a bicycle, if you have a food, and goodness sakes, a refrigerator with food, you're rich. You are rich by the world standards. Ask our people who are going to Honduras in a couple of months. You're rich. You're rich. And as much as culture tells us we need to have more, I mean, isn't that what the ads are about? Commercials, flyers, got to have it. They tell us we need it. Here's the reality. Money can't fix our loneliness. And some of you know what I'm talking about. All the money in the world can't fix loneliness. All the money in the world can't fix our brokenness. All the money in the world can't fix our emptiness or fill our emptiness. All the money in the world can't buy happiness. It can for a short time. But whatever it is you bought that made you happy, it's not going to last. It's going to wear out or become obsolete. And in the words of some wise songwriters, money can't buy us love. You know that song, right? You don't want me to sing it. It can't, can it? Talk about identity theft. The world is stealing our identity. Because our identity is in Christ. The world's going to tell us our identity is found in stuff. And it's not. Our self-worth is not defined by our stuff or what we have, but it's defined by who we belong to. Self-worth is defined through belonging. And Paul nails that. Maybe we'll come back to this chapter because I don't feel I did it justice this morning. I'm being really honest. But Paul nails it. Paul tells us we've been adopted. Paul tells us we belong. And not only does Paul tell us we belong, but the writers of the Heidelberg Catechism Paul writes it in the first chapter of Ephesians. This is who you belong to. Isn't it interesting that the writers of the Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer, Lord's Day number one, tell us where our identity is. They start out with the same thing Paul did. They tell us where our identity is. And the question they ask is, what is your only comfort? Let me just say, what is your only satisfaction? What is your only content? What is your real identity in life or death? And the answer is this, that I'm not my own, but belong. You see that? Right up front, but belong. Body and soul, life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for my sins with His precious blood. That's what we're talking about. That's Ephesians 1. And He set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to Him. And Christ by His Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life. You see the deposit there? This is rich. rich. Assures me of eternal life. It makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for Him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray and then we'll have communion. Father God, we thank you.